Hello, this is John Mizgela, and I'm going to go through uh, some orthopedics assessment information with you. So to start with orthopedics, a good rule of thumb is that if you know your anatomy, uh, it's going to make it a lot easier for you to not only describe what you're looking at, but also to get an idea of normal versus abnormal. Uh, knowing your bones is going to be helpful for fractures, so knowing fracture location, fracture type. Muscles become very important, uh, as well as your tendons and ligaments, because they're going to help you identify potential problems. So if you're examining a patient that comes in with shoulder pain, knee pain, um, back pain, you want to have an idea of your major bones in the area, as well as your major muscular st um, structures, because it's going to allow you to have an understanding of what causes what motions, and if it's in a muscle strain pattern, an idea of where you should be focusing your treatment. Most physical exams start with the same general um, process. So when you're doing anything in the musculoskeletal spectrum, first thing you're gonna normally do is look at the area, right? So you wanna take have the patient take their um, clothing off and get into a gown so that you can fully examine the skin. That way you're not missing something like a rash to the area, open wounds, open fractures, anything like that. Plus it's also gonna be helpful if you're concerned about strains, sprains, broken bones that you can see the skin because then you can identify any bruising, any swelling, any discoloration. Uh, you're going to check, you know, your, your neurovascular status. So always a good idea to start by putting them in a gown. Uh, after that, you're going to touch the area. So palpation, you want to make sure that you're doing what we just talked about, checking vascular status, checking for sensation, checking for prepidus or any other gross deformities. And then you're going to go through and you're going to start doing your testing. So range of motion, making sure that everything is moving in a direction you would expect it to move. Again, this goes back to knowing your basics of anatomy and physiology. Uh, strength testing is in your neurovascular component. So you want to make sure that when you're examining anything in terms of orthopedics, that you're checking strength, getting them up, having them walk around, things of that nature. Special tests, there'll be some more slides later on about those. Uh, and then thinking about the joint above and below. People come in with complaints of knee pain and you'll do a knee exam and there won't be anything wrong with their knee, but then you go and examine the hip and it turns out that's where the pain is um, actually originating. So you got to be mindful of referred pain. So good rule of thumb of anything when you're doing a physical exam is always looking at the joint above or below. This is just a brief refresher of some of our terminology that we use. So adduction, um, you're adding closer to the body, right? So if my arms are out and I'm going to bring them closer, that's adduction. Abduction is if you're going away from the body. Flexion, extension, think about flexing. You're flexing your biceps, you're extending your arm. Circumduction, circle, right? Circumduction, circle. Internal, external rotation, away and towards the body. Inversion, eversion, in and out. Uh, we're, I'm not gonna go too great into detail with this. The point of the slide is mostly to remind you, you know, we talked about knowing your normal anatomy, physiology of expected areas, but then it's also a good idea when you're doing things like flexion, extension, you have to have a general idea of how far something should go or how lax something should be. Because if you don't know normal, it's gonna be very difficult to identify abnormal. So these are just some general ranges that you would expect, you know, the arm to bend at the elbow, the wrist to move, the fingers to move, things of that nature. So again, having an understanding of general normal makes it easier for you to identify abnormal. Muscle strength, this is just a grading system that you use, five being the best, zero being the worst. Uh, generally speaking, the lower the number, the less strength you have, the less ability you have to do anything, going from full strength at five to essentially paralysis at zero. This is helpful when you're documenting because it's a universal grading system. So if someone's coming behind you and they see you know, quadriceps strength three out of five, they have a general idea of what it is you were finding on your exam. Uh, going into some of the major muscular musculoskeletal complaint areas now, so rotator cuff, this is going to be a big one that you come across in clinical practice. So again, knowing that your anatomy and physiology, the rotator cuff is made up of four separate muscles and the tendons that connect them. So you have the supraspinatus up top, the infraspinatus, the teres minor, just slight, or, sorry, teres minor, but, uh, 
slightly below that. And then on the front, you have the subscapularis. So this becomes important because you might identify that they have a rotator cuff injury where they come in with shoulder pain. There's going to be different testing that can be done that can help you decide which muscle is irritated or which of these is, might be torn, which is contributing to their pain and decreased range of motion. So by doing specific maneuvers that elicit the strength of these muscles, that allows you to uh, just drill down a little bit more and do a good physical exam to figure out what might be going on. So if you look at the breakdown here, the supraspinatus elevates the shoulder joint out to the side, right? So that's going to be helpful for up and down motion. And for spinatus and uh, teres minor, help with external rotation, right? Almost like a, a pitcher doing a throw. And then your subscapularis um, allows the humerus to move freely during elevation of the arm, right? So again, elevation of the arm. So if you're identifying weakness with one of those through physical exam, it's going to be able, you're going to be able to pinpoint uh, their concern a lot more easily. This just reinforces what we talked about in terms of knowing the function and movement of those different rotator cuff muscles. Rotator cuff pain, uh, so anything from tendonitis to tendinopathy to a full tear, different degrees of inflammation and location, small tears with inflammation, just general inflammation and tendonitis. Tear by itself is just a tear through the rotator cuff. This is essentially elicited through physical exam, right? So you do a good history, you gather information, mechanism of injury, uh, numbness, weakness, tingling, all of the good things that you would normally do. And then you go through your various shoulder range of motion exercises to figure out where's the majority of their pain, uh, what weakness do they have? This is a video that will play through the PowerPoint. Uh, I'm not going to play it now, but this will go through several of the shoulder exam techniques, your Hawkins test, your drop arm test, and it'll give you an idea of how to elicit different exam findings through these various maneuvers, which um, evaluate the shoulder joint. This is another one, just a different description. Hello, doctors. Uh, they're going to play anyway. What do we do about it, right? So if we have a rotator cuff tear or injury, what do we do next? Well, a variety of things can be done. Physical therapy, cortisone injections. So they see an orthopedic or a pain management specialist who goes in and puts a steroid in the area. Oral medications, surgery, usually in primary care, which is maybe the focus of a lot of what we're talking about today. Uh, referral to physical therapy, anti-inflammatories, topical agents would be our starting point. Once we're getting into cortisone injections, surgery, certainly more second, third line treatments, something that the majority of you are hopefully not going to be doing in the primary care setting. So that's when you're going to refer out to your orthopedic colleagues. Spinal column, right? You can't talk about orthopedic injuries or orthopedic assessment without talking about the spine. So this is just a breakdown of the different levels and the number there. Again, knowing your anatomy, how many cervical vertebrae, the natural curvature of the spine, sacrum coccyx, and having an idea when you're doing your physical exam, if you're pressing in this area, you know, maybe you're not fully able to identify L1, 2, 3, or 4, but having a general understanding that it's in the lumbar spine is a definitely a good thing to be able to do. So spinal cord injury, uh, we have a variety of symptoms, right? So spinal cord is kind of a big deal in our body. Obviously, it acts as a big support structure in keeping us upright, but it also has various nerves, blood vessels that flow through it. So if the spinal canal is getting compressed or pinched or impinged or there's trauma to it, uh, you have to be mindful of what's in there. Again, knowing your anatomy, because that's going to dictate some of these symptoms. So if you're having loss of movement, um, loss of control over bladder, concerning neurologic findings, uh, numbness, weakness, difficulty in walking, right? All those downstream effects. Uh, it'll also help you identify where the injury might be. You know, if you have numbness in your hands, it's anywhere from the fingertips up to the cervical spine, loss of control over bladder, usually going to originate somewhere in the um, thoracic lumbar spinal region. <clears throat> weakness paralysis, same idea, right? So it can help you the more symptoms you're able to elicit from the patient, the better idea you, you might have in terms of narrowing down location, which will help with both diagnosis and treatment. Uh, spinal stenosis, so essentially a narrowing of the spinal canal, numbness, sciatica, weakness, back pain. 
common trend here, right? Uh, just a lot of neurologic symptoms. Dermatomes, so this is what we started to talk about in terms of innervation. So this will tell you the areas that those particular uh, nerves from the spine innervate within the body. So if someone's saying that they have numbness, you know, around their knee, well, that's the L4 region. So you can be concerned or you should have on your differential some sort of um, injury or compression to the lumbar spine. You know, if they have it, uh, they're having sexual dysfunction or urinary changes, then you're in the S2, S3, that saddle region, right? So you're concerned that there's some sort of compression down in the sacral area, lower lumbar spine. So it can help differentiate where you are in terms of your diagnosis. This is just more detail in terms of the specific maneuvers and actions based on the nerve root as well as the muscles involved. So C4, shoulder elevation, it also helps with the diaphragm, trapezius, so on and so forth. Ankle dorsiflexion, toe extension, knee extension. This is why you're having people walk on their toes, walk on their heels, testing range of motion, testing strength. A little bit more information on where the deep tendon reflexes originate, and then another grading scale. This one's for deep tendon reflexes. Four is very brisk, hyperactive. Two, so middle of the road here, it's a little bit unique, is our normal response. Four is almost too reactive, and zero is not reactive at all. So again, having a common terminology that you can grade stuff on helps because it'll make better documentation both for you as well as anybody coming after you, orthopedics, neurology, anything like that, they can see what you started with. So if you document that they have a two uh, biceps tendon reflex and I come afterwards and find that it's a, a one or a zero, well, that's a change. So now that's concerning because I have to evaluate what happened to make it go from a two to, to a zero. These are exams for eliciting cervical spine um, pathologies. So again, it's a video that you can watch at your leisure. Awkwardly playing. Some other ones a little bit lower down the body. Some general abnormal curvatures of the spine. So we have lower doses, so increased anterior lumbar curve from neutral, kyphosis, kind of up and in, flat back, so no specific curvature, sway back, uh, decreased anterior lumbar curve increased posterior thoracic curve from neutral and then scoliosis, which is just that lateral curvature uh, that we were hopefully checking on our younger people uh, in their physical exams. So again, knowing normal, if you have a general idea of the normal curvature of the spine, when you're looking at somebody when you first walk in or from a lateral view, you should be able to identify some abnormal curvatures uh, in their spine, which will take you down a different pathway. And again, you know, if the spine is twisted and curved, that's going to definitely cause some downstream symptoms, whether that's in range of motion, ambulation, uh, paresthesias, anything like that. So you want to be mindful that, again, normal, a deviation away from normal, what kind of effects is that going to have on the rest of the body? Now, this is some um, exam maneuvers for the low back. So what are we going to do if there's a spinal cord imaging? Well, if there's trauma, emergency care, right? They're in a car accident, they fall off the ladder. First thing you're going to do is call EMS and get them over to the emergency room uh, to ensure that they don't have fractures, compressions, anything else that requires, you know, immediate uh, intervention. Beyond that, uh, medication, you know, they're going to be painful. Uh, immobilization, if they've broken something, you want to make sure, you know, if you have a C-spine injury, you don't want the person moving all over the place until they've been appropriately cleared, either through clinical rules or imaging. So you want to make sure you're mobilizing. Surgery and rehab, potentially, depending on what's going on. You could also think of physical therapy as part of rehabilitation. Moving down to the hip, right? So we started with the shoulder, moved to the back, and now we're to the hip. Some of the more common presentations you're going to see in terms of location for um, musculoskeletal or orthopedic complaints within the primary care setting. Most people with fractures, um, ankle sprains, things of that nature, they might come to primary care, but the majority of them are going to be going to emergency rooms, urgent care centers, things of that nature. So this is geared more towards the primary care setting. So again, anatomy, right? You got a lot of bones, a lot of joints, a lot of stuff going on in the hip area. 
So you want to make sure you have an idea of what's supposed to be where, because that's going to help guide your assessment, help guide your diagnostics and uh, your treatment. Osteoarthritis, uh, so stiffness when putting on shoes and socks, pain in the front, pain down the leg, difficulty walking, might develop a limb, uh, pain arising from a chair. So you see how we were talking earlier that people might feel it here in the knee. Uh, but it's actually originating in the hip and there's radiation and overcompensation. So again, good history uh, and information gathering is crucial to get an idea of what symptoms they have, but then also a good physical exam to ensure that you're going to be evaluating the right area. You don't want to do a full knee assessment only to find out, you know, six months later that it was actually originating from the hip the whole time. This is a video on various hip joint maneuvers. This is a good video, it's a little lengthy, but it goes through kind of the top of the exam all the way through various maneuvers. So that is, is a good one. So what do we do about it? Hip pain, osteoarthritis, um, short of you know fracture, dislocation, and surgical treatment, common theme today. So rest, ice if appropriate, elevation if able, compression if appropriate, um, physical therapy. You can do minimally invasive surgeries up to a full hip replacement if need be. So NSAIDs, anti-inflammatories, all of the stuff that you would start with for really just about any musculoskeletal complaint, it's going to be the common theme today. So start with less invasive and then go up to more invasive as, as needed. Uh, so this is the knee. So there's a lot of ligaments in here, your ACL, your MCL, your LCL, ACL, uh, PCL. So again, knowing your anatomy, because that's going to be important when you're doing an exam, uh, as well as your mechanism. Someone has a planting and twisting injury versus a direct blow that might take you down different pathways. Having an idea, so medial, middle, lateral is the outside, knowing that your meniscus are in here. So making sure when you're doing your physical exam and your special maneuvers, you want to have an idea of the anatomy, because if it's weak over here, or I can push the legs uh, much farther back than I would anticipate, that's going to key me in on which ligament might be injured. Knee injury symptoms, swelling, trouble walking, popping, clicking, stiffness, unable to bear weight, pain, all the stuff we've been talking about with all the joints, right? Shoulder, back, hip, uh, again, doing a good physical exam because these symptoms will overlap and they can cer certainly refer. Special tests for the knees, so McMurray's, so on and so forth. These will key you in on the way you're going where you're pushing, where you're pulling, where you're popping and twisting. Again, knowing your anatomy is going to help you identify what it is you're evaluating. The second component with that too is that while there are a lot of fancy tests out there that have a lot of fancy names, if you have a general idea of your anatomy, so if I know that if I'm pushing, that's putting stress on the PCL and the ACL, and it's moving too far in a direction, if I think about what should be stopping that, so let's say I'm pushing the knee back and it's going all the way back and I could pull it all the way forward, I'm concerned that there's some sort of damage to the PCL and the ACL because those ligaments should be stopping the knee from moving too far back and too far forward. So maybe I don't know the specific name of that test, but I know that if I'm doing this physical exam and I remember my general range of motion and laxity guidelines, I can say, hmm, you know, I don't specifically remember this, but I know this is way too loose. So I've got to evaluate this a little bit more. Surgical versus conservative, same principle, right? Do we need to rush them to surgery now or can I try conservative stuff? This can be dictated on your level of urgency, um, mechanism of injury, exam findings, so traumatic injuries, athletes, things like that. You might be a little bit more apt to get them to surgical consult quicker than you would be someone who just has knee pain for a year. You don't have a suspicion of a tear or anything like that. You can go more down your conservative route to start with. Strains versus sprains might not seem like a huge difference, but from a technical standpoint, uh, there is a difference. So our strains involve the tendon, which is what the muscles connected to, to the bone. So muscle, tendon, bone, right? Our Achilles tendon, probably one of the more common ones that you're gonna, or that you know. And then your sprain is ligaments. My way I like remember it, strain T for tendon, uh, and then you're left with sprain, which is just leaves the ligaments because there's nothing else. So a sprain in the ankle, is different than a strain of the ankle because one's tendons and one's ligaments. So like we just talked about, symptom-wise, very similar. You know, it's pain, difficulty moving, perhaps some bruising and swelling, uh, 
range of motion may be more or less depending on the injury, instability, muscle spasm. So a lot of symptom overlap. Different grades for ligamentous injuries. Again, so full grading. Uh, slightly torn would be a grade one. Fully torn is a grade three. Obviously, the higher the grade, the more unstable the ankle is going to be. If you look or anything is going to be. So if you're looking at this, remember this, the ligaments are what is holding the bones in place. So if they're not there, nothing's really stopping that particular area from moving in areas it doesn't normally go to. What do we do about it? Or I'm sorry, um, grade classification again. So just the worse the grade, usually the worse the pain and swelling, the worse the strength and function, and then the worse the tear, the longer the recovery time. So just like anything else, really. Uh, this is just a pictorial view of the same thing. Now, what are we going to do about it? Well, common theme, right? So price, the new rice, P is now for protect. So this is splints and supports. Then we still have rest, ice, compression, and elevation. Common theme, you know, most orthopedic injuries, most musculoskeletal complaints are going to start out the same way unless you have concerns for neurovascular compromise, if there's open wounds, if you feel like they need surgery immediately, short of any of those real emergent, urgent conditions, you're going to start with the same process, rest, ice, compression, elevate, reevaluate in the near future. This is just a picture of the bone in an effort to give you a little bit refresher on your anatomy, different layers of the bone, different sections of the bone. Again, this becomes important because if you're going to order an x-ray, a lot of the times, especially on kids, if you're talking about growth plates, they're going to classify fractures based on the location of the bone. So if you don't know, you know, what areas, what on your anatomy, it's going to make it a little bit more difficult for you to read your x-ray reports. Symptoms of a bone fracture, I mean, it's pretty straightforward, swelling, maybe a hematoma or blood collection. Uh, open fractures are going to be bones sticking out of the skin, unnatural limb position. So if you look at the arm and again, knowing you're normal, it doesn't appear to be in normal alignment, be concerning for a fracture, difficulty with mobility, soreness at the site. When do we order an x-ray? So there are various calculators and scoring criteria out there. Your Ottawa ankle rules, um, PCARN for head injuries, Canadian C-spine, Nexus criteria. So there's a variety of them out there. A good, a good chunk of them are in this PowerPoint for your review, but they essentially tell you when we need to get imaging and when we don't. Not all musculoskeletal or orthopedic image, uh, injuries or complaints of pain need to have an x-ray done, right? You want to be mindful of not ordering tests just for the sake of ordering them. You want to have a good reason for it. So this helps guide when you should get imaging. Uh, this is just a different scoring criteria for when to image the knee, when to image the ankle. So again, if you're having tenderness in any of these areas or you can't bear weight, then you can consider a, an x-ray. This is also helpful because if you don't think an x-ray is warranted, this can help support your decision-making for not ordering imaging. Um, so it's, it's just a good rule of thumb. If there's risk stratification calculators and guidelines out there to try and use them when available appropriately, obviously, and then to document them in your note, because then if someone comes behind you and says, well, why didn't you x-ray the ankle after they fell in that hole, you can say, well, based on my exam and the Ottawa ankle rules, uh, there was a low risk for fracture. So did shared decision-making, decided it wasn't worth it at this time, but then gave good return precautions. So if they are not getting better, they're getting worse, come back and we can always get a picture later. So again, just having the conversation and then being uh, good at your documentation is half the battle. These are a variety of fractures. So transverse is through, oblique is at that angle, spiral is a twisting motion, comminated is just a lot of small breaks all over the place. Avulsion is essentially a break off uh, an end of the bone, but not a full separation. And a green stick is a fracture, almost like a, a breaking motion. So Salter Harris, this is when you were talking about fractures in children. So remember kids have growth plates, right? So as they get bigger, 
where the bones fully fuse together and then they get to whatever size they're going to be. If you have breaks along those growth plates, uh, it can be concerning. So Salter Harris is the classica classification fracture that's pretty much universally accepted or nationally accepted, I guess, in terms of classification for where it is on that growth plate. Uh, so S is straight across the growth plate, A is above the growth plate. So again, if this is the growth plate, it's good breaks going to be up here. L is lower than the growth plate. T. He is through everything. Those last three, those last three, depending on where they're at will dictate um they're just gonna be more detrimental so you want to have a lower threshold for getting them over with orthopedics what do we do about the fractures again traumatic you're going to go through your abcds airway breathing circulation so on and so forth uh reduce if it's an open or close reduction right so if it's a frat place um you might need to realign it it's more emergency room based stuff again you're very rarely going to be doing that in primary care. Mobilization, so your splints or possibly surgery with fixation and then rehab. So same process, the only thing that's really different is if there's open or closed, and then do we need to do anything about it? Splinting, uh, so we'll go more hands-on with this in immersion weekend, but depending on the break, you're going to majority of the time put them some, some sort of splint because you wanna minimize unnecessary movement right if you have a non-displaced fracture you want to keep it non-displaced so if you're going to put a splint on it to minimize the opportunity for it to open and for, for it to shift out of place so there are a variety of splints out there the location along with the potential fracture is going to dictate what splint you use or what combination of splints you use this is a video on splinting uh, so again i'm not going to play this but this will give you an idea of the splinting process this is more on splinting in terms of how to actually use a splint. Osteoarthritis. So this is a normal knee, right? Again, we've got our cartilage and our meniscus pads and all of your ligaments, which aren't there. And there's normal spacing in there, right? That gives you that range of motion, that bending back and forth. As that starts to break down, you have narrowing of the space, you have cartilage loss, you develop bone spurs. So when people have pain and decreased mobility, and stiffness, that's where that comes from, right? Knowing your normal anatomy versus your abnormal findings. This obviously looks significantly worse than this. So if you can imagine trying to bang this and put pressure on this, it's going to be uncomfortable. So symptoms, pain, stiffness, tenderness, grating sensation, right? If we look at grating sensation, well, there's no real space there. And if we just have bone gliding along bone, it's going to feel pretty grating. It's going to be very uncomfortable. Swelling, same principle, right? If you have bone rubbing on bone all the time without any padding there, the body's going to naturally react to try and minimize any more damage. So as a result, you can have swelling and tenderness because body's sending all of those inflammatory uh, mechanisms to try and help the knee unsuccessfully, but it's trying its best. What do we do about it? Well, again, common theme, oral medications, your NSAIDs, your anti-inflammatories, your topical medications, Alternative medications and therapies, lifestyle interventions, weight loss, devices and braces, uh, injectables, so again, to your steroids. Common theme, right? So these six things are not really any different than anything else we've done for any of the orthopedic complaints today. It's just a different location. And that's it. Obviously, you can't ask me questions in this setting, um, but I hope you enjoyed the orthopedics lecture and I look forward to seeing you in the near future.